So what have you been up to? How's things going? It's going well. Going Wait, good, so when man. did you retire? You Has it been? 2019. Okay. Oh, so it's been a couple of years already. It's been a couple of years. Wow. And it's going well for you? Yeah, man. I locked into a great job um, working for and you're an back at, space company. It, it's back just, where it's you awesome. want to be? Back back in your yep. the area that you want to be? That's awesome. Back in, back in Ohio. Nice. Right on. So I was talking to, um, I just got done talking to Brandy and Schleich. And um, we were uh, just going over some old stuff. And uh, I first, before we get into all that, I was going to, your name was dropped, of course. We're talking about, you know, the, <laughs> the old unit. So your name came up a bunch. Um, but before I get into all that stuff, take me through like, because you, when you got to the 17th, you, did you, you cross trained from being a, well, you were being a, you were a cop, right? Yep. Security police. Okay. So just take me through all that. Like you, you cross trained or how was that? I mean, I've never, I, you and I've never really talked about that part of your career. Like, was that, how was it? Was it, uh, was it okay? Was it, you know, what was it? So back in the nineties, when I cross trained, I had a weird experience. Uh, so when I cross trained, they messed up my paperwork and they PCS me to Fort Lewis to okay. the, uh, to the fifth ASOS. So I was there for a good, six months before I went to the TACP schoolhouse. Oh, really? And yeah, of course, back in those days, BDUs, I still had my cop badge on. Uh, and I wore my blue beret for about two days and realized that was not a smart thing to do. <laughs> Where people, so, <laughs> I can only imagine how <laughs> the, the reception you got. <laughs> it was terrible. So, you know, they embraced me as a, as a, as a bro, if you will, but I hadn't yeah. earned my black beret yet. So, so it was a little rough. And then I obviously went to the schoolhouse, uh, you know, made it through. No problem. Came back. How long? Wait, so you, th- you said you were there six months and then you went to the schoolhouse? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What'd you do? <laughs> what they have you doing? I did. It was great for me because I did PT with them. So I really got to get in really, really good shape before I went to the schoolhouse. Yeah. And then, you know, I learned the jerk 206 palette before I even went to the schoolhouse. Nice. So. It was really nice for me because I got there and that was actually a pretty easy portion of the course uh, for me. Uh, Who was at the fifth when you got up there? So my my boss, my NCYC was Mike Gallagher. Uh, J.R. Perez was there. Okay. Uh, You have Mike Griffith, Gary Knowles, and Charlie Keyball. Okay. They were all all supporting the Rangers. Of course, that's all really pre-17th. Okay. Uh, I was going to ask, so, like, so that was when the fifth was kind of covering down on that mission. That's right. Okay. That's right. So it was Charlie, uh, Gary, and then um, who else you say was there? Oh, Griffith. Griff. That's right. And then Griff. so it was the three of them. Who was Westfall there at that time? Yeah, Westfall was there. Um, yeah, if you name names that would probably come back to me, I'd have to sit and think about it. But those are the ones that kind of pop up to the top of my mind. Okay. Uh, How was that? Was those guys doing what they were doing? Was that like kind of an influence on you going your route? Yeah. And I'll tell you, the reason being is because we played uh, intramural football. So Mike Griffith was on the team, key ball, Gary Knowles and those guys. So I would listen to their stories and, you know, talking about the free fall mission. And yeah, so it was like, man, I really want to go do this. Uh, And it it was a major influence on me. So looking up to those guys. Right on. <clears throat> so you're at the fifth. How long were you at the fifth? Um, gen- you know, roughly. So I, I know pretty much exactly. Uh, in, I got selected. It was, back then, it wasn't a selection like it is today. It was right. just a selection ran by the fifth ASOS guys that supported the second Rage Battalion. I yep. got selected and then uh, 2002. So very early on in 2002. Matter of a fact, I remember when I got to Fort Benning, Literally within the first 48 hours of being there, Jazz Erickson pulled me into his office and said, hey, I can't tell you where, but you're getting ready to go overseas somewhere. It's going to be mountainous terrain and you don't have much time to get ready. So (laughs) you better buckle up. So. (laughs) And then shortly after that, you're probably deployed with, were you, did you cover, which company were you in? So I was with Bravo company. Okay. uh, On my first deployment. All right. Yeah. Yep. So was that, did you go right away in 02 or did you, was it a little bit later than that? Or I think we had, I had a little bit of a spin up. So I had a, a about two or three months okay. where I was 
training with Hank House and Otter. Tommy Case took me under his wing and really, you know, helped me out a great deal. And then, of course, Brandenburg yeah, yeah. Uh, really, really helped me become a JTAC throughout my entire career. He mentored me, but especially getting ready to go to Afghanistan, I really didn't know what I was getting into. So um, it was really baptism it's, by fire. For sure. Yeah, it's like such a rude awakening from <clears throat> going from the fifth. Not that like those guys did what they could to mentor you there. But unless you're really doing the mission, it's kind of tough to get an idea of the difference between like a fifth, like a conventional ASOS and then like where you were going. But like the fifth, that's a good place to start, though. I mean, there's a lot of good there's a lot of good people at the fifth. That's like always been a traditionally kind of a good oh, unit. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's kind of lucky. Um, so let's go back to the fifth. So before when did what did you get to the fifth? I got there in 98. OK, late late uh in 98 and then i was in the schoolhouse in 99 and graduated in 99 okay did you do anything while you're at the fifth like any <clears throat> cool training missions or any kind of like uh deployments or anything like that no not at all in fact you know the most exciting thing we did was went out to uh ntc the national oh, training right. center yeah, yeah um yep that was the most so, exciting thing we did okay so but you were there when <laughs> you were there in 2001 in September. So yep. what, how was, what was the vibe there? Like we were already at the 17th. So like, what was the vibe at like a conventional ASOS when that all went down? Like when the, <clears throat> when you guys are watching it on TV and you know, did, was there any, was there any hint that you got that like they may spin you up or, you know, you guys should get ready or anything like that? We, I mean, we got ready, but I'll be honest with you. Looking back, it's like, we had no idea what we were doing The and the commander, not because he was incompetent, but he also didn't understand you know, what's going to happen. Or, are we going to be in global war or <laughs> right? You know, and no one, did, yeah. no one knew what, yeah. what was going to be, what was going to happen. So I had been selected to go to the 17th um, just prior to the towers coming down. Okay. So I knew that when I got there, I knew that I was going to be potentially deploying pretty rapidly. Uh, but we had no indication. We, we didn't think that we were, we were really going to deploy. Uh, from okay. the fifth ASOS. Yeah. So you get the Rangers. Um, you, you immediately went to Bravo Company, third battalion. Who was the uh, NCOIC at that time? Of the, of the, who was it? I believe it was uh, Sean O'Neill. Oh, okay. All right. Yeah. So Sean was in charge. So that's before he went to, I guess that was before we all kind of went back to recce. So Sean was in charge of there. What were, so I was in ACO. And then you came in for B. Who was in Seco at that time? Was that Tommy or? Uh, no, I'm pretty sure it was Hank House. So oh, Hank, at that right. time, really, we had two JTACs per company once I got yeah, yeah. there, uh, essentially. Right. Okay. So then um, tell me about like your first spin up and your first deployment. Like, what? how was it? How was all that? Like, take, kind of take me through that sequence of Jazz telling you to get ready and then you get ready and then you go. Like, how, tell me about that. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm learning new stuff like from day one. Um, I have to learn the jump mission. So I got to oh, yeah. get spun up on how the Rangers do things, the Ranger SOP. I'm getting issued gear I've never even seen before. <laughs> and then, of course, back then, you know, we had basically a blank check of GWAT money. So we're yeah. going and buying things like Etrex Garmin's. We're getting all kinds of what we would call Gucci gear. All, right. all kinds of specialized type equipment that I'm like, I don't even know where to put this stuff. Where do I put my GPS? Where do I put my magazines? It sounds silly, but it, you know, you're getting ready to go into combat. The, the, those are the little things you just, yeah. And on top of all that, at the 17th, you're expected to be the JTAC. So to say you're a good JTAC in the 17th means nothing. And that's true today. Every JTAC there is at the top of their game. So I came in really not at the top of my game. I'm drinking from a fire hose trying to understand the Ranger mission. So luckily, again, I had guys like Billy Otter, Hank House, yourself, Brandenburg, uh, Jason Cuisenberry, Sean O'Neill. Yeah. They realized I was a little rough around the edges. Um, but, man, they got me spun up really quick. And by the time we left and uh, went to Afghanistan, uh, out to Wasadabad, I felt pretty confident that I could I could do the mission. Uh, working with the Rangers, my confidence level wasn't super high because I still hadn't completely got immersed into that company. 
where other people know everybody on a first name basis. So, right. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's kind of like for everybody. And once they get in, you just, anybody that comes in there and tries to, um, say anything at all is kind of, um, making a mistake. You know what I mean? You yeah. just got to oh, yeah. kind of be quiet, just yep. you know, absorb as much as you can. So you went to yep. ABAD first. Um, what did you guys do there? Did you guys, um, what kind of missions were you running out of ABAD? Honestly, at that time, they were still looking for Bin Laden, right? So yeah. they still thought that he could be, They we were basically searching rat lines and, you know, mountain passes into Pakistan where they thought that he could be. And I would say once every couple of weeks, they, there was some intel that came in that, hey, there is a possibility that he's at location X. So we would drive for hours, dismount, <laughs> and then, you know, walk up mountains. And sometimes we would come in contact with guys. Most of the time, it was just a lot of walking, yeah. uh, a lot of combat patrols. What, what we did, the what we did mostly was just combat patrols via vehicle driving to these locations where where we thought bin Laden or or other high level folks within his posse uh, were possibly hanging out or trying to escape into Pakistan. Right. Um, that's what we did the whole the whole time we were there. We got attacked pretty frequently because back then it was it was basically just Hesco barriers <laughs> and a little piece of dirt sleeping on cots, as you well know. Yeah. You had no hardened structures. Uh, we didn't have latrines. You know, you were peeing in tubes and covering it with lime. Yeah. Well, we you were, guys were like, yeah, because we didn't even that initial push into Afghanistan wasn't even in Afghanistan. I mean, you got we. It wasn't until like the end of our first rotation that they even went you know, established a foothold there in, in Bagram. So, yeah, you guys were just, you were coming in on the, at the very beginning of any of that stuff getting st getting stood up. So, yeah, that's crazy. So were you, and then, of course, at the outstations, I mean, like Abad and Shkin and all those places, there was nothing there. I mean, it was like, oh, yeah, you know, uh, water can showers. And, you know, if you had a shower, yeah. you'd have to rig it up, you know, yourself or, you know, just yeah. eating chow, just eating MREs. Yeah, that was a, yeah, that was a weird time. I, I will tell you something. My first mission in Asadabad, it's this is a funny, embarrassing story. Yeah, let's but, hear it. And and a few people know this, but uh, it's always <laughs> funny to tell it. So my first real mission where I'm going out by myself. So uh, typically it was Billy Otter going out and we would rotate. Mm -hmm. And he had went on a couple missions in a row. So he was asleep. It was a QRF mission. And I get up on sat and Eric Brandenburg is telling me, what aircraft I'm going to have checking in, be on this frequency. And well, we were gone in like five minutes. So I'm up on the net, the adrenaline's pumping. And I know that I'm going to make contact with an ODA team who's in contact. And I hear this call sign come over the, the radio, Playboy 65. I'll never forget it. <laughs> and so I said, Playboy 65, this is Stryker. Uh, give me your, give me your lineup. You know, what are you carrying? What's your fuel time? And then, <laughs> and then, of course, uh, about five seconds later, Playboy 65 informed me that he was indeed the JTAC that I was coming to provide uh, backup for. And it was oh. Troy Lundquist. Oh, really? So, yeah, Troy Lundquist. So, he's like, I don't yeah. have anything, dude. I need your help. I got no standard conventional load. I like, yeah. So, that was very interesting for me. That was like my first foray out into the field. By myself yeah, that's an easy, is the only that, JTAC. That's an easy mistake to make. I mean, who'd, who'd have thought you were going to, you know, make contact with those guys? You know, you thought you were getting assets. You thought you were getting fire support stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. So what? Yeah. So whatever came of that, like, what, um, what, did you get any assets? I mean, what happened? What was the rest of that story? Yeah, we got assets. I worked some of the assets. Troy worked the rest of them. Nobody, I don't think any ordinance was dropped. Yeah. Uh, they really were able to deal with whatever situation they were dealing with. And we really just set up a, a blocking position and provided them a, a, a line of friendlies to, to come back into. Oh, okay. And then they collapse, they collapse back to ABAB with us uh, with, with really no issues. So were they, they were at a safe house or were they out on a patrol or what were they doing? They, they were, yeah, they ended up coming back to ABAD. I think they were operating out of JBAD at the time and they okay. spent some time, some time at ABAD after that, but they were operating, I think mainly out of Jalalabad. Okay. That's funny. Um, you did mention something about, 
Okay, so here, this this got brought up, obviously, because that's what we always bring up. Because we were talking about how many, first of all, I want to talk about how many total missions or how many total deployments you went on. And then I want to talk about kind of like a few of those that we, that some famous, like, infam, or I guess infamous stories about it. So <laughs> we, we know you're in double digits. How many total deployments did you do during OEF and OIF? So total was, was 12 total. Okay. So was it, was that how many in Afghanistan? Did you go to OIF at all? Did you ever make it over there? Yeah. So that was I was actually seven to OIF. So okay. seven to Iraq, wow. um, and then five to Afghanistan. Okay. So when we're we we're talking about the the other day, there was that mission where you hurt your you hurt your back. Um, yeah. Can you can you take us from like. Uh, start to finish like the beginning when you first got the mission and you were getting your kit ready and you were going can you start from there and then tell us all the way to where you got evac'd out yeah and th and that deployment that was uh that was 2006 and that was only a three-week deployment so that oh, really? was our first yeah that was our first mission um so at that time i was with the battalion recce team um and we were planning a mission where we were going to uh, get inserted via fast rope uh, on top of a mountain. And we were just to provide overwatch for Josh Gavlik's company, which was doing an assault, uh, on a town that was really at the base of the mountain in, in some flat area. So prior, prior to going out and I'll tell you something about this story that I've only told a few guys, um, towards the end as, as it pertains to my injury. Um, so me and Gav got together. We, we had a plan, right? We had a comms plan. Uh, he knew what I knew what my job was. He knew what his job was. My job is really just a supporting role. And my job was to really handle a majority of the assets and just kind of hand those off to Gab as needed. Uh, we come up with a good plan on where he wanted me to direct some of the ISR assets for overwatch and things like that while he's focused on the actual assault. Okay. And it was going to be like a simultaneous you know, we land, get into Overwatch, and then I think five, ten minutes later, they come in uh, on the X and, and conduct the assault. But during that mission, we had decided to take uh, an, a young ALO named Captain Ben Cox with us. Um, that was his first mission as a Ranger on on the ground. Okay. And yeah, I remember him. Yep, he great guy. He ended up being a really great ALO and uh, just a just a good dude. So honestly, a lot of the, a lot of the mission details are a little bit blurry, um, uh, for obvious reasons. For sure. Uh, but so we're going in on that. And of course we're all bearded up, uh, with being the battalion recce. And because I had a lot of experience with fast roping at that point, um, and the rest of the chalk was fairly inexperienced. They made me, uh, one of the rope masters okay. roping out of a Chinook. So as you know, with the Chinook, you got Rope Master number one and Rope Master number two. Yep. So we were on Chalk one, and we knew where the HLZ was. Me and the other Rope Master had a plan. Hey, you know, break Kims. The Low Master will throw the ropes. We confirm that there's two green Kims on the ground. You know, good to go. So we take off from Bagram. I think it was probably about an hour flight. Back in those days, we were really, really flying hundreds of kilometers to get to the target. Yeah. Um. So as we're coming in, and I didn't have comms up with the aircraft, we're really just visual and hand signals with the loadmaster. They initially came in, and there was some brownout, and the loadmaster kind of waved me and me and the other rope master off, and we didn't know what was going on. And you could feel the bird take back off and kind of did some kind of go around. So we're trying to ask the loadmaster what's going on. The loadmaster, we're not getting any, inform any information from him other than we believe that the primary HLZ was fouled for some reason. Um, so there's a quick go around. Uh, the bird comes in and flares. There's brown out. That kind of clears out. And the loadmaster gives us the thumbs up. He kicks the ropes. Me and the loadmaster look down and confirm there's, there's two green chem lights. Yeah. So I'm like, Thumbs up. We're good to go, man. We know that we're on solid ground. It looked like solid ground to me. Right. Um, so we both went first and I come down on the, what, what would have been the right side rope. And I remember my feet getting caught up. And as you well know, 
your priority when you hit the ground is to clear the rope. Get out of there. Because you got other guys. Yep, you got other guys coming down behind you. Some of those guys are carrying two forties and saws and a lot of weight. And if they hit you, they can break your neck. Yeah. Uh, so as I'm clearing the rope, um, I just remember my foot kind of getting tangled. I'm clearing it, and then I remember being in free fall. Oh my! And I God. tell people, I felt like I was in free fall for three minutes. I remember thinking of my my then uh, wife. She's now my ex-wife, but she was pregnant with our daughter. Oh wow! I I don't even know what she's going to look like. I'll never get to see her. Never get wow. to see my mom and dad again. My sister. But of course, this all happens in a millisecond. Sure, but sure. But it is funny how I just remember thinking about all that stuff and how it just slows down, and your mind just like goes through all yep. of that right away. Yep. So I remember being in free fall. Just remember the last thing I remember is this is how it ends. This is crazy. And then my I felt my face hit, oh. and I felt my my neck snap back, oh and then God. I I I heard and felt this crunch. Now, I didn't know it at the time, but that was my T4 and T5 compressing into a few hundred pieces. It's called a burst fracture. Oh and unfortunately God. for me, it severed the, the bands that control breathing. So I was having a lot of trouble breathing. I felt like the wind got knocked out of me. But typically when you have the wind knocked out of you, you do get your breath back after a certain amount of time. But yeah. I, I was not getting my breath back. So I was just lay laying there thinking. Did you have armor on? Okay, I, Were you guys yeah. wearing armor? Oh my god! Yeah, body armor, helmet, the whole deal. Um, and when you go back, there's actually a classified video. I don't have access to it anymore, but the AC-130 actually videotaped the whole thing. Oh my god! So, so the distance that I fell has gotten much higher over time. But honestly, <laughs> it was probably about one story, which is still a pretty far fall to land on your head. No, for sure. Um, yeah. With all that weight. I mean, you probably had a radio on your back and body, oh, armor, yeah. like you said, a body armor helmet. You had all your magazines and your kit. Yeah. Oh yep. my God. I had a lot of stuff. So what happened so then? All, so you're on the ground. So I'm on the ground. I remember thinking. You have okay, no idea what's I, happened yet. You have no idea. You no idea yet. what had happened. No idea. I knew I couldn't breathe, but I'm like, I got to breathe. If I breathe shallow, if I can just keep getting some air in my lungs I'll, until someone finds me, I'll be okay. I had rolled down the mountain just a little bit. Um, and all I remember, wait, wait, so I back could, up. So we kind of went from you roped in and then you were in a free fall. Yeah. But we really haven't nailed down. So they, they, they put you in on top of a building on top of a, yeah. They, yeah. Was it a one story hut you said or something? What so was it was it? like a little one story hut that was built into the side of a mountain. Okay. Um, so all the guys were on the left side of the rope when they hit the ground, they're basically running into the side of the mountain on okay. the rooftop. Gotcha. And it would it, it didn't take them long to realize they were on a roof because they run into the side of a mountain and they had time to look around. The guys on the right side uh, did not know that we were on a roof. And me being the first guy, I had no idea. I feel like I'm just stepping out and clearing the rope. But actually what I was doing was clearing the roof. Uh, so you were that. Right so I, see, in my mind, when I hear this story, I think like you hit the roof and then you ran a little bit. But you you yeah. roped in like kind of on the edge of the building, and you just like yeah. roped in, cleared the rope, and boom, out, off the side. It did anybody come down with you, or did, did they see you go? And they're like, "Oh, sh this is." So yeah, everybody kept coming because it's brown out. You can't really yeah. see anything. And here's right. the great thing that happened: me getting tangled up in the rope, and then the bird drifted some. You can see it all on video. I I don't even know. Yeah, you know, you'd probably never be able to find that video again. I'd love to see that video. It would be, it, it was cool to see it, uh, you know, several months later, but what happened was the aircraft drifted a little bit. So the guys that roped after me, JD, they got to the end of the rope and I think it was a, it was a 90 foot fast rope. So they got to the end of the rope and then had to let go. So guys were kind of falling. Oh, oh my. And oh, were, so they, so the rope had come off the building. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Did anybody else get hurt? So, uh, Captain Cox, the ALO, I don't think he broke his nose, but he was bleeding pretty profusely from his nose. One guy twisted his ankle. I think there was a couple broken wrists. Guys were just, it was just a mass of bodies. Um, it was insane. So I, as I'm laying there, I'm just wondering if anyone's ever going to find me. I honestly, I, I kind of don't know what's going on at this point. Right. All I remember is some, and this is the best way to describe it because this is vivid in my mind. This really tall black guy, a ranger, he walks up to me, looks down. He goes, dude, you're messed up. 
<laughs> and he Sounds grabs me by my <laughs> arbav and he drags me i don't know it could have been five feet it could have been 20 but he drags me what seems like a long distance and then the medic the medic gets on and starts start, starts treating me at that point um how did that so feel when he was dragging you? I mean, was it painful or were you in shock at that time or what or what was going I, on? I was just trying to focus on getting air into my lungs because yeah. yeah, the pain in my back was immense. Uh, but I the breathing was the thing that scared me the most because I couldn't breathe very good. Um so th- what's funny is so they finally got me up there. Mike Shovery, who ended up to this day, is still one of my best friends. We talk frequently. Um uh, he retired as a sergeant major a few years ago, and now he goes around training special mission units uh, on, you know, medical techniques, tactics, and procedures uh, for for a small company. And as he was treating me, he taped a fentanyl lollipop to my finger and and was kind of checking my vitals, filling out my casualty card, which I still have. Um, <laughs> and uh, I had blood all over my face, in my eyes, in my nose, in my mouth. And they're trying to find the source of the bleeding. And what they realized after a period of time that Captain Cox was bleeding all over my face. <laughs> and so, so it was not my blood. It was his blood <laughs> all in my face. Well, I'm glad that he was that concerned where he was that close where he, you know, his blood was getting on you. He was, at least he didn't ditch you or anything. Yeah. And I'll tell you what's really awesome. Captain Cox, I found this out later, but he got up on the, he was supposed to be watching me and learning and kind of seeing how JTACs do things. Yeah. He got up on the mic and he took over the mission, right? I mean, from the second it happened and he's got blood all over the place. I'm hurt. He's talking to the aircraft. He's communicating with Gavlik and they are now, you know, uh, fighting the fight uh, without nice. me. So down to JTAC. Uh, Wait, so where was Gav at this time? He was, he, I mean, you, in, with regard to where you were, where was he? Like, how many hundred meters away, or was he like a click away? Or I, I, I think he was at least two or three clicks away. Okay. Yeah, he was he was quite a distance away. Um, go ahead. Well, was he engaged, or was he was it like it was it like a two prong attack? And well, like you said, he came on the so you guys came in on the like the Y, I guess, and then yep. he came so he inserted on the X, and you guys were just passing the mass sets. So the mission just went on. So you were just, you were there. Did they, did you have to wait until the end of the mission to be extracted or did they try to get you out of there as, you know, as soon as possible? Or how so, so what they initially wanted to do, and of course, since me and Mike are friends, I found all this out later. They wanted to put me on a Skegco. They wanted to move me down the mountain and get me to some flat terrain. We were in some pretty steep terrain. It was rough. Yeah. And, well, you had to rope in. I mean, it wasn't like there was any yep. HLZs around. I mean, otherwise they would just land. Correct. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. And to Mike's testament, Mike was a young medic at the time. He would not allow them. He said, guys, we cannot move this guy because we're going to risk spinal cord injury. And thank Good God. For him. He, yeah. They did not allow that. So what they ended up doing is working a special uh, basket hoist extraction. No kidding. Yep. So they brought in the 160th. They came back and, and it took about an hour. So Gav's mission is still going on. So you have that mission going on. And then the, the mountain, what I call rescue, right? The right. mountain extraction. Well, so they bring in the one, 160th. Uh, they get me into the basket. And I just remember going up and I remember thinking, man, I you know, this is weird. I'm suspended in midair, probably hundreds of feet over the ground. The basket's spinning, so now I'm getting oh like, gosh. now I'm getting sick. Uh, but I finally get up and um, getting the bird, and I've got, I, of course, I got you know some of the best medics in the world treat me on the bird, right? Um, but what's funny is the first, the their first first thing they wanted to do is get me to the first field hospital they could. To this day, I couldn't tell you where it was, but I get there, I go into this like, just totally like out of in the middle of nowhere fob and i'm laying on this table i got lights i got nurses i got people checking me out they're giving me morphine and i remember looking up at this doctor who's checking me out and he says man do i know you and i'm kind of looking at him i'm kind of loopy and i said sir you look really familiar and he's like well my name's dr paul and i go dr paul you're the guy that fixed my acl last year when i tore it oh my god so this guy that had repaired my ACL a year prior is the first 
uh, surgeon I see at my first stop. Um, that is crazy. In, yeah, in my long my long journey back to the states. Um, funny story though, JD. Not funny, but yeah, I wish Gav was still here so I could yeah. could tell him. And I think we talked about it a couple of times. But when you tell people you f- you fall that far, and the doctors, you know, when I finally was at a point where I'm back in the states and they're kind of looking. The doctor said, I should have broken my, my C-spine, which means paralyzed from the neck down and, and probably would have died uh, because I just wouldn't have been able to breathe yeah. and, and likely would have died. So I will tell you why my neck did not break and all that energy was transferred to the middle of my back and, and I had the burst fracture. Me and Gavlik argued before the mission about what antenna I should take. All right. And I just I just wanted to take the little flex blade, which is a three foot flex blade antenna. Yeah, that is, you know, and he told me, you got to take the long whip. I'm like, dude, I don't like it because it's long. It sticks up and it pokes me in the back of the neck all night. He's like, dude, take it because I'm going to be able I'm going to need to be able to talk to you. So I just finally got sick of hearing him argue <laughs> with me. And I just put the long whip on my radio and. And the doctors, there's no way to really prove it, but that is probably the reason that I'm not a paraplegic or dead because I just got sick of hearing Gav complain about it. And I took the <laughs> long whip and the long whip acted as a kind like of a, a neck brace. roll. Yeah, yep, yeah, it was a brace. So it stopped my neck from going all the way back, which probably would have, it definitely would have snapped my neck. So Jesus. That... Yeah. yeah, I know. I don't think I ever got to tell Gav that. Oh man. Yeah, that's that's amazing, dude. So it's, talking about the ACL. Um so so anyway, so is that you went to the first field hospital, then what? Then you went to they take you to Germany or did they go did you go back to the States right away or how'd that work? Yeah, I went to the field hospital, then I went to Bagram. Bagram they put me in like a full body cast just from the well not full body cast, but a body cast from the from the chin down to uh just above my my groin area yeah uh to stay because there's nothing they can do sir they can't do surgery i mean the back's broken all they can do is yeah make sure that my spinal cord is not swelling and nothing like that um so they finally got me on a bird and i flew back to um the states uh or excuse me back to germany where i met the first sergeant jack spurling at the time yeah and then he he escorted me but on our way back to uh, back to the states, there they had an in-flight emergency, Jeez. so they had to touch down in, I think it was uh, so it was like Syracuse, New York, or somewhere, and the bird was going to be broke for three days. So I ended up in a I ended up in some civilian hospital, like outside of Buffalo, New York, I think. Really? Yep. And the first sergeant was with me, and at this hospital. I remember the first sergeant talking to the, 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 the medics that were on the C-17 crew, the medics that were treating me. And they said, Hey, we've talked to the hospital staff and they're not going to be able to give Mark any morphine or any pain medication. It's some kind of rule, whatever. So they told the first sergeant, they, they give him a box of drugs. He put it in his backpack and they said, here's what you do. Every two hours he needs so and so milligrams of Percocet, and then an hour after that, he needs oxycodone. Then he needs this, because if they wouldn't have did that, I, they said the pain level would have been oh excruciating. I'm sure. Yeah. Yep. And I will tell you, Jack Sperling. Of course, he wasn't attack P. Uh, but man, that guy, he went to airborne school. He actually went to great aerosol guy. school. Yeah, yeah, great guy. And I will tell you, night one, uh, the hospital staff come in and said, "Hey, visiting hours are about to conclude." you need to get to your hotel. He's like, well, I'm going to stay here with Mark. Um, you know, just kind of like, yeah, no, thanks. I'll stay here with him and I'll sleep on the floor or sleep on this chair. So they said, well, sir, you can't stay. He's like, well, I'm, I'm going to stay. So about 20 minutes later, several hospital staff came in and said, Hey, listen, I, I understand this guy's hurt. He's your guy. You want to take care of him, but you just, you cannot stay here. It, it's, it's against hospital rules. Under no circumstances can you stay. And I remember him saying, go ahead and call the highway patrol, call the local police, because he goes, you have to drag me out of the hospital. Period. Dot. That's just the way it's going to be. So he said, you're going to have to arrest me. 
handcuff me, and even then I'm going to fight you, and <laughs> you're going to you're going to pay hell get me out of this out of this room, let alone the hospital. Yeah. And so he's he stayed there and slept in that chair for for what ended up being two nights right by my side, never left me. I don't even remember ever seeing the guy eat. Really? Yeah. He was such a great guy. I mean, he was like, he was like one of those, he, it was almost like he understood no hit. And it's just his personality. He's like, I see, it was like, whatever he did before he got to our unit and was like, all right, this is what is expected of me. This is what I need to do. And he stepped up and did it. Yep. That's yeah. He was a great leader, man. They just don't make guys like that anymore that totally assimilate to the culture that they're in. And he understood, understands that he's not an operator. He's not trying to be more than he needs to be. He's a first sergeant. First and foremost, right. I'm going to assimilate. What do these guys need for me to make them successful in the battlefield? And that's what the guy did. So, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was, a, you know, that was an amazing experience. And I, and I learned a lot about leadership uh, and just in my short time with him, uh, escorting me back and, and putting being a servant leader. Yeah. You wore that. So then after that, you got, then you made it back to Georgia or. Yeah. Then I, I, uh, yeah, went to Fort Gordon and then that's, that's where I, uh, the family picked me up. And then at that point I was able to drive. I was still heavily drugged. I was actually still on morphine, yeah. uh, but I, I, I was able to drive from Fort Gordon to Fort Benning and then started seeing, getting regular care with the doctor, um, and the specialists that would oversee my reha- rehabilitation. You wore that uh, brace for a while, though, didn't you? I, me- I remember seeing you or seeing pictures of you or whatever. You you had it on for how long? How long yeah, that metal brace. Thing? They made me wear it for like two months. Yeah. So it wasn't too bad. It wasn't yeah. too bad. Uh, but it was just, again, my, my spinal cord was really never in any danger. But anytime you have a burst fracture, there could be little shards of it that can that can nick the spinal cord. So yeah. they just wanted to keep me as stable as possible sure. to allow it to heal. How long did it take you before you were back doing uh back up a hundred percent? So I, I think it was like eight months later and then I deployed uh, like nine or 10 months after the initial injury. Yeah. That's what so, we were talking about. I talked to Brandy and Schleich about this. We were like, what are you, and I want to get back to the ACL thing. Cause I never, I never heard that story, but you like you tore your ACL, you broke your back. I know you had malaria at one point, you know, and none yeah. of this stuff, none of your ears, we're bleeding in Miranda. We talked about that story. <laughs> yeah. uh, none of these things precluded you from deploying. Like it was always, you always, you know, you, you did your, you know, uh, your recovery time. Obviously you couldn't go while you're injured, but you know, you, you did your, you got injured, you did your recovery and you bam, you're right back in the fight, which was, it's, it's like really commendable, you know, that you were, yeah. a lot of guys would be like, uh, you know what? I'm good. I had to, all this, all these things are happening. I'm going to take a break or I'm going to go somewhere <laughs> else, but you just kept plugging away, man. It was great. Yeah. Well, I mean, you have to, right? I remember in 2003, we went to Iraq. We were there, I think, 63 days. We came home, you know, ticker tape parade. Yay. We invaded Iraq, took them out. And then yeah. my company got selected to go right back. Uh, I think it was within within 60 days. We were back for back in Baghdad. And then that's when the missions got really real. And I remember the very first, uh, the very first week we were there, Joe Kapacheski, uh, who's a who's a legendary ranger, he was in an IED and got his leg blown off and Jeez. got sent back to the states. And I remember seeing him running on his prosthetic leg, um, and I just, you know, I'm like that man. If that guy that that guy had some heart, I mean, he jumped out of airplanes with this prosthetic leg, yeah. and I I just was surrounded by guys that never gave up ever. Right. And you well, know, you in the seventeenth. You fit firmly in that mold. I mean, you were one of those guys, you know, I mean, you know, it, it might, while your injury could have, I, I mean, while you didn't lose in a limb, I mean, you still broke your back, you know, I mean, yeah. it was, you know, you had a blow. No, it's really commendable. So what, what happened with the ACL? They'd mentioned that too. Yeah, that was in Iraq. No, that was in, uh, that was during football. We were oh. playing football for PT. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Now you're part of this story. I don't know if oh, you know right. this. I, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Wait, I think so, I, I, it's all, it's now that you mentioned that it's kind of coming back, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it should come back to you. But, you know, I tell people my, <laughs> like my 12 deployments and my time in the military, I remember little things. And then, you know, I don't remember all the details, but we were playing football and I went up to catch a pass and came down on my left leg and I felt and heard this loud pop and I knew something was bad. 
and uh, Hank House, uh, you were there. Yeah. You, I, I know I, you were there, and you guys were telling me to get up and quit being a wuss. So <laughs> that sounds about right. Yep, I got up, and for for three days I tried to do PT and tried to do some other things, but I'm like, ah, there's something wrong. I I can't. So uh, I went to uh, went and got the got the MRI and had a torn ACL. So had that repaired, and then you know was and then was able to make it on the on the next deployment. And then nice. of course I broke my back and that set me back a little bit, but, um, but I always just happened to heal up just in time for the next deployment. Yeah. So. That's, what, that's what we're talking about. It's like you, you never miss one. You know, you're like, yep. you just, you go, you get injured, you deal with it and then you're ready to go. Yep, What's a, to. what you, I don't, I kind of mentioned malaria, like it wasn't a big deal, but that was like, you were almost, you almost died during that yeah. time. Right. I mean, that was yeah. you were like on your it deathbed. Did. What, yeah. what, what, Pat, what deployment was that on? Or what, I mean, you were, you went to, Afga- it had to be Afghanistan. I don't, we didn't do a lot of malaria it meds was. in OIF, did we? Yeah, 2002. And it was my first deployment to Asadabad. Yeah. And I got, I got it early on. Of course, I think I lost like 50 pounds. Yeah. Everybody was losing weight back then. We were just yep. skin and bones, right? Couldn't work out. You couldn't do cardio. You were just humping the mountains all day long. Right. But I got in malaria and I, had been a little bit sick, but I didn't think anything of it. Um, but Russell Hank house had been extremely sick and they thought that Russell had malaria. Right. So at the end of the three month deployment, they needed one JTAC to stay behind. And I volunteered, uh, and, and Hank house volunteered, but because they thought he had malaria, they sent him back to the States. Okay. He gets back to the States. It turns out he didn't have malaria, but I was in Afghanistan for another three months and I actually have malaria. So. Wait, so you had it, you had it at that time. And then they're like, you got to stay anyway, or. We didn't, we didn't know I had it. I was, I was generally okay. We get back to the States and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm sick because how malaria works in a very weird way. It attacks your body and uh, every like 72 hours. These little okay. parasites come up. They feed on your li- they feed on your bloodstream. Then they go back in the liver until they until they eat your next meal. It gives you the fever. It makes you sick, nauseous. It's awful. So I yeah, didn't they're think almost like dormant, they're dormant in the liver, and they then they'll come out the like liver. you said, come out. And that's kind of what that me- the meds they gave us would do is it would keep all that stuff in the liver, and then at the end of it, you like purge it or whatever. But sometimes it doesn't obviously it doesn't yeah. work. So. Yeah, yeah, because I, yeah. I was in my system for so long, the primitive yeah. one did not did not clean me out. So we deployed to Iraq. Uh, I was sick during the Iraq deployment. We got back from that, and then I went right back to Iraq. And again, I'm still sick. I'm still like, still not doing good. And so at about, at, when I got back from that deployment, I was actually in Seattle and passed out on my then mother in law's floor in a pool of puke. And oh. I had like a hundred and six degree temperature. Oh my um, god! I, at that point, I had had malaria for over one year in my body. Oh my so, god! That's what I'm saying. Like so, you're lucky you're not uh, dead. You were you're yeah. You were lucky. I, like I don't even know how. It's just sheer will. I think that you just stayed alive. Yeah, I. I mean, I don't know. I had went to the ER. What's funny is that whole time I'd went to the ER two or three times, saying, "Listen, I am." I don't know what's going on with me. I am extremely sick. And a couple of times I got told, Hey, go see your primary care doctor. Quit wasting our time at the ER. Right. Because, you know, 103, 104 degree temperature, man. I mean, it, it starts frying your brain. Yeah. So luckily they, I went to a Naval hospital, uh, the ER, the, and they figured out there some young Lieutenant was like, Hey, I was just got back from a medical conference. This looks like malaria. So they did a blood smear. They had to fly it to some hospital in Seattle. And they're like, yeah, this guy has, this guy has malaria. So I was in the hospital for three days while they treated me through an IV for P. Vivax malaria. Jeez. So, yeah. So pretty fortunate. Yeah. No kidding. So like once, once it gets all flushed out, then you're good. Or I mean, like yeah. they, what their treatment was, and then you're good to go after that. You're good. You're good to go. Yeah. Once it's gone, it's gone. P. Vivax is a really good, I guess, if there is a good uh, strain of malaria to get, that's a good one because uh, there's no side effects once it's gone. Oh, okay. You just, you have to just live your life and <laughs> yeah. That's bananas, dude. Yeah. Um, 
So then, okay, so you were a cop, went to the 5th, you went to the 17th, you were at, uh, you were in BCO, 3rd Battalion. Yeah. Um, when did you go over to uh, our, was it RRC when you went over or was it still RRD? It was, it was still RRD and I, okay. I, I think the, for my first so you're old like me then. Yeah, but not as old as you. <laughs> you you were you were the trailblazer in RRD. Um, yeah, so I think well, it was Q 2007. and Sean, I mean those guys. Yeah, actually, to be honest, we talk a lot about RRD. The real trailblazers were guys like Paul Ford, um, yeah. Andy yeah. Cornelius. Uh, I'm trying to think who else was in. Um, I know those two for sure. I, I'm sure I'm missing somebody that I should know, but anyway, so like those guys were in it way back in the day, and then um, and then they they restood it up with me and Q and, and Sean. Yep. Um, but then, so, okay, so go ahead. So when did you go over? Um, like, when did you yeah, go over two, to RRD? Uh, 2007, but, I, but it was that, during that time, I had just healed from my broken back. So I had to get a bunch of waivers and, you know, they wanted to make sure I could get those approved. Yeah. So I got the waivers for the back, the knee and all that stuff. And then I went off to free fall school. Nice. Uh, yep. So right when I got back from free fall school, I got assigned to a team. And that team was actually getting ready to break up and kind of reform. And RRC as a whole was really starting to shape into something a lot more organized at that point. Okay. Um, were there so, were there more teams? Were there still three or were, were there more by then? I, I I don't know. I think there were still only three teams at that time when I went over. Okay. Um, there could have been six. I, I can't be sure. Okay. Yeah. It's all yeah. hazy for me too. I mean, I was kind of like, I, I tell everybody – I was so heads down at that time. Like, you know, you do your thing, you come back, you live yeah. your life. You know, it's, I wasn't really a lot of more. I mean, I guess I should have been a little more aware of what was happening, but a lot of guys know like everything that happened with that whole, you know, with a whole breakdown of that, where the team, how many teams there were and who was on them and stuff. But yeah. Um, so then uh, when did you do your first deployment with those guys? Yeah. Two, 2008. Okay. 2008. And, uh, I think, I think that was to, yeah, I'm pretty certain that was to Afghanistan. Who was on uh, your no. team? It was to Iraq, excuse me. Uh, okay. So at that time it was uh, Hank, uh, his last name's escaping me. You have Will Oh, Bowie, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah uh, Fred Tolman. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, Ray Plasher. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Those are good dudes. Um, there was a couple other guys that, actually ended up going to selection and I think they're still operating. So yeah, I won't say their names, but sure. Um, sure. So, but my, but the, but the first guys was uh, like Dylan Foreman. Yeah. Because I, I was with them. I was with them for some training and initially that was what the team makeup was Dylan Foreman and uh, some of those older, older guys uh, that were, were getting ready to go on and do some other things within that yeah, company. Yeah. So yeah, Dylan, wasn't he on, I think he was on two with Brandy for a while. And then yeah, he, I thought they were on the same team. Yeah, they were. Yeah. They absolutely were. That was awesome. That was crazy. Um, yeah. So I heard a story about like some in 09. There was like you guys got new. Did you were you ambushed or did somebody ambush you? So it's a I did not. I was not initially ambushed. What it, what we were doing at the time. And I I protested this entire mission because yeah. um, we were working for another government agency. Yeah, yeah. And they were doing things that I did not consider worth our time. And right. I thought this is just a lot of driving around, trying to make contact and, and trying to get ourselves in, in a firefight for no reason. Yeah. Um, so this particular mission, I had I had told uh, I had told this other government agency lead. I said, listen, I, I'm going to call my higher up and tell him that this is a waste of time. I don't know why we're driving around for three days you have no clear objective and we're just opening ourselves up to a firefight or an ambush. Um, so I was eventually trumped and they said, you know what, when those guys go out, they got to have a JTAC with them. And then that means the entire team's got to go. Yeah. So we, so we went so on this you, mission. At that time, the, the OGA, that was a bunch of locals too, right? Is that, was that, you were still doing oh, that yeah. kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. Oh yeah. We had yeah, a lot yeah. of locals with us. Yeah. Yeah. Like it's so fun of this, locals. Like, yeah, yeah a ton remember. of them. Yeah. We had this massive convoy, yeah. several vehicles, and it is 
boring as all get out. I got oh, nothing yeah. overhead because it's like we can't miles afford. of that stuff. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And so yeah, I, go, Joe well, Deeper, I didn't mean, I didn't want to gloss over that point yeah. you were just trying to make that. Yeah. Those convos are so long. It was, it was hard to keep any kind of asset overhead because you were out there for like hours and hours and hours. Yeah. And it's like, nothing's going on. You can't take that away from somebody yeah. else. And yeah. 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 Yeah, exactly. I mean, the, you know, it's not like we have endless aircraft that just, you know, they got the task force to support. They got the regular army, like you know, guys need that. So right. we're just driving. Right. And I'm just hoping I don't have to do my job. <laughs> um, so we kind of split the convoy to where there was five minutes of separation. You had like a lead convoy with local nationals. You had two, uh, RRC team members embedded with them. And then right. the rest of us were back with the rest of the local nationals. And so there was some separation and all I remember hearing over SATCOM, it just, all of a sudden I heard over SATCOM, uh, it, it, I learned it was Ray Plasterer. He was calling back to the jock. And he said, I need Cass. I need Cass right now. And we can just hear gunfire and explosions in the background. Jeez. So, yeah, at that point, we're just like, we got to put the hammer down. We can't communicate with them. We don't right. have line of sight. And it took us a, it took us about 10 minutes to get there. And when we finally Which is like get a lifetime, where, you know, in a firefight. Yeah, it, absolutely a lifetime. So we got there and um, to, to kind of describe the terrain. We drive to uh, the edge of what of what I would describe as a bowl. Okay. There is this big, big, giant, like concave bowl with one house down there. And all I see is pure chaos. I can see our vehicles. They have been shot up, messed up. I don't know where at this point, I can only assume that our two guys are dead. Yeah, I don't know where they are. I know I have B1 showing up at this time. I got Oof. A10s in route. I got uh, an F15 overhead, but all I have is a B1. Uh, so I started started kind of working. He can't do much for me as far as telling me what's going on. Right. And this is a very close contact fight at this point. Did he have any kind of pod or anything? To to was he, or was what was he slick? Yeah, he was. He had a pod and he was able to get on the the only single structure there was. But you got to realize we have local nationals mixing yeah. it up with oh, yeah, with guys that look just like they do, <laughs> right? Except for the Afghan flag they have on their you know their their yep. uh, slap patch there on their arm. I don't know who's who. Um, we got the local nationals. They want to go like get into the fight immediately, but we're like we're trying we'll to make have it worse. Tur- hold them back. We can't make it worse. Um, and then we have the other government agency guys that are there. We don't know what their status is. We right. can see their vehicle. It's shot up really bad. Yes. Um, and then we learned, we learned that there was about 30 Taliban that had ambushed like the first four or five vehicles. So I think really all told it was like, it ended up being 30 Taliban against like six of our guys that's two rrc guys and a couple of the other government agency guys i so i don't want to say too much other than one of the other government agency guys got killed with his own weapon hand-to-hand combat he lost his weapon and then got shot with his own weapon and killed jeez the uh, the other two guys stayed in the vehicle behind the bulletproof glass and armor of the Hilux vehicle. Right. And the two RRC guys, which both of them ended up getting silver stars, rightfully so. I think they sure. they probably should have got more than that, but they ended up fighting fighting these guys off to the point where they actually had to retrograde a little bit. And they were kind of starting to come up behind us by the time we had gotten there. And that was the first time in combat I ever got to use the 40 millimeter thump gun. Right on. Um, nice. So, yeah. So I just took a, a group of Afghan nationals with me. I'm waiting on assets to show up. And th- we're just sitting there plinking these guys as they're flanking us. Um, and then we had a bunch more guys come over, set up a good perimeter. And we were pretty secure. We still didn't know what the situation was. We were talking. Uh, we had heard our guys on the radio. So at that point, we knew at least one of them was alive. Yeah. And once I got the B1 on this house... He was really excited to to drop a bomb, and sure. something in my gut just said, 
we can't do it. I do not have positive uh, identification of where all my friendlies are. I can't do it. It's just, so something kept telling me, don't do it. The RRC leader at the time was telling me, let's drop that house, man. Let's drop it. Because we were shooting everything we could into that house yeah. to try to bring it down because they had they were using that as a hard point um, to put effective fire on, on our guys that were down there. And I told him, I said, listen, I, if our guys are alive, they might be inside that building or they might be on the other side. Long and you know this. To, it's a very long story, but at the end of the day, I decided not to drop. And luckily, after we had finally made our way down, our guys were on the back side of that house using it as cover. Man. If I would have put, if I would have put the two thousand pounders in that house, fratricide, both of them probably would have been dead. That's your job. You did your job, man. Yeah, you did the right you thing. Have that, to. It, it, in in. Everybody, everybody was doing the right thing. The B one's like, look, I'm here to drop bombs. I want to yep. drop my bomb. And the, and the team leader was like, look, I'm making a command decision. I think we need to drop that house because we're taking a lot of effective fire from that place. But you, as a JTAC, have to take all that data, figure it all out, and and kind of use your gut too. And you made the right yep. decision, man. You said, yeah, you saved those guys' lives, man. That's yep. that's awesome. Yep. That's really but commendable, that, dude. But, you know, that's just one aspect. Those guys that were down there, I'm telling you, they were, it was absolutely heroic. And, you know, I'm oh. still good friends with, actually, uh, one of the guys, just because he's still active duty, I don't want to say his name, but, uh, yeah, I just I just went to his wedding uh, here in Ohio, uh, his wedding reception, I should say, because I couldn't make it to the wedding a yeah. few few weeks or a few months ago. So we're no still kidding. connected to this day. Yeah. Oh, still really good friends. Who was the uh, guy that, uh, that you can say, who was the other guy? Uh, Ray Plaster. Plaster. That's right. Yeah. 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 Uh, two, two really good Rangers doing what Rangers do. Right. Yeah. Like overwhelming odds, put effective fire on the enemy, you know, shoot, move and communicate. That's what they were doing, man. Yeah. It was awesome. I mean, there's a reason why those OGA guys wanted us with them because no, there. I don't know any of their background. It was kind of hit and miss. I don't want to say. I don't know who they were. Nobody kind of really knew who they were, but they knew that if you put those type of guys with them, yep. if yep. the if you get into some sort of scrape, you're going to have guys that know what they're doing. Because and here's what people forget. I don't know if they forget it, but maybe sometimes I forget it. But those guys came from somewhere, right? We look at these these recce dudes as like uh, you know they're really scored away. They got all these badges. They've done all this stuff but they all came from battalion, yes. right? They all came yep. from a company or a squad. They were all Rangers. They were all a PFC and battalion and uh, were grown to be just the baddest of asses, you know? So like yeah. once they get to that, that recce level, they're like, they, they are, I would, they're comparable to any elite unit in a, around, you know, as far as I'm concerned. Um, yeah. So yeah, you get two guys like that who, you know, the other, their job is to take pictures or report back, you know, or whatever. But when it comes down to it, they know how to fight, too. I mean, that's that's one thing about that that whole detachment of the whole company now um, that I really loved was that they they were fighters first. You know, they, they knew how to do all that stuff. So, you, you know, you know, you know, J.D., I th this is one of those stories that just like a, uh, to, to as a testament to the Rangers and the fact that they that it's mission first. Right. Rangers yeah. lead the way. For sure. I don't even know what deployment it was, but I remember we were on a deployment and we had squirters off the X and they had an air QRF, which was a CH 47. And it yeah. had, it had a small Ranger squad. And I remember they, they directed that aircraft to cut off the squirters. And we didn't find this out until later, but I remember watching that QRF bird come in, in the distance about maybe a click for me. And I just remember seeing these black dots coming out the back of the aircraft. And I'm like, I, that, what am I seeing? I don't even know what I'm seeing. <laughs> we found out after the mission that the aircraft could not touch down. So it was hovering about 10 feet off the ground. So the, the squad leader and the first two guys thought they were stepping onto the ground. Oh my God. They were actually falling out of the back of the aircraft. Oh my God. The look, by the time the loadmaster realized what was going, he stopped the last guy, which is a private. And he was like a saw or a 240 gunner. Yeah. And he said, dude, we're not on the ground. And the private said, I know, but I got to follow my squad. And the dude jumped off the back of the aircraft. 
I mean, if you think 10 feet, <laughs> it, 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 like that doesn't seem like a lot of, but th- that's a long way down, especially when like you were like, yeah. like when you got a bunch of kid on, like kind of like what you had when you broke your back, yeah. I mean, jumping down with like a, you know, you may have, you know, a heavy machine gun or whatever, a radio on your back or body armor. That 10 feet is a long way, especially coming down from a helicopter where you don't know what's what's down there. And of yeah. course that kid would be like, you know, I got to go. I have to go. Yeah. He's like, dude, I'm go- I'm following my squad. Like I, if I break a leg or die, who cares? Right. And that right. kid just, he just jumped off. But, but at the time I didn't know the five black dots I was watching was five guys just jumping out of the back of an aircraft that hadn't touched the ground. But all they know is they got to get on the ground and interdict the squirter. Uh, and I think, I think some dude did break his ankle. I think that was like the most serious injury there, but it's just, it's amazing. Right. Like Rangers, yeah. I, we were so fortunate to get to be with those guys. For sure. I, 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 I always felt so safe and secure and comfortable. And I knew no matter what happened to me, those guys would die trying to, trying to get to me. Yeah. You, know, you look at Roberts Ridge and you look at, there's just tons of examples of Rangers will do whatever it takes to mm-hmm. make sure the last man makes it home. Yep. And it's not even so much like I'm doing it for it, it. It is, it is like a there. You know, you you grow you uh, formulate a relationship with these guys. Um, yeah. But but they would do it for somebody they hated. You know, if it meant if it meant saving yeah. Americans, they would they would do it. You know, it, it's not hundred percent. It's like they do the right thing. You know, regardless of what you know how they feel about it or whatever. So yep. yeah. Yeah, people don't realize we moved mountains and stopped a war to go rescue Jessica Lynch. <laughs> right. And yeah. That was, that was led by, you know, the Rangers and some other, some other units that are connected to, um, you know, other special mission units, but we stopped the war. The task force stopped, pivoted to Jessica Lynch, rescued her, and then went right back to doing what they were doing. And yeah. that's a testament to, to the special operations community yeah. and, and American soldiers in general. For sure. Yeah. That was amazing. That was really cool. Um, so I mentioned Marana. What? Just real quick. What? Uh, what was the deal? Were you using? Okay, so for people who don't know, we go, we used to go do these jump trips. Um, and so when you were jumping, this they had that those heads the new we had some new headset or something. Were you? Did you use a different one or were we using the same ones that we were using? I think we had like a wired. The wired ones, but there were also wireless ones. Yeah. So, or I don't know. I, I, it doesn't matter what kind it was. The bottom yeah. line was, you. I. I just remember you coming down, and I don't know if you were you complaining about being in pain. I don't remember you complaining about. It. I thought you were just walking through the, the area there, and we're like, dude, you got you got blood yeah. coming out of your ears. So it. it what had happened before we had left a cup comp- because you know where we were companies reached out to us all the time like hey yeah. we got some new gear we'll give you some free stuff to check out right and it was it was uh so it was the ear mold you put inside your ear and then okay. you can connect it to like your embedder at the time or whatever yeah, radio yeah. you had oh you because were jumping those to- okay yeah that was like a I- yeah all right good yep but I, I was testing these out, right? So I got several free sets, and I'm like, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take them and test them. Um, so that particular uh, full mission profile, we were doing a very rare 25,000 foot hey low. So that's jump at 25,000, and you're you're riding the rook down to, I think we were pulling about 6,000 at that time. Yeah. You, uh, so it's a long ride down. It's- uh, rapid, rapid decompression. It's- it was at night, yep. right? Yeah, th- this was a night jump. So uh, yeah. we jump. I actually had a really good exit, and I'm like, okay, this is cool, man. I'm stable. You know, not much can go bad at this point until we pull. And I'm watching the other jumpers. I can see the chem lights, and you know, it's just super peaceful. You know, especially if you didn't tumble and you had a good exit, and it's like right. some relief, yeah. right? Yeah. But I started to feel something in my ears. I'm like, man, something doesn't feel right. Something doesn't feel right. And what I didn't know is pressure is building up. And the the stuff that I was testing, the earpieces I was testing, they did not have a release valve. So air cannot get out. All this pressure from the rapid decompression is building, building, building. And then I heard this super loud pop. And I just felt pain go from my ears. like all the way down into my gut 
But then I remember like, okay, well, whatever happened, my ears just popped. That's all it was. My ears popped. No big deal. What I didn't realize is my eardrums had just exploded. And so that's what the blub was. So the blub was actually down the, the side of my cheeks because I was in free fall when they busted. And the oh. blood was coming out of my ear and like running all over my face. But you, you don't know that when you're in free fall. No. Yeah. Um, so. So, yeah, that was. And then, of course, my jump trip was over at that point. I could. Oh, yeah. They didn't uh, let you jump anymore. After that. Yeah. Really we kidding. only had a couple of days left. But, you know, I just sit on the ground and, and um, you know, there's really nothing you can do for a busted eardrum. You just have to let it heal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That was a crazy thing seeing that. Just that blood, blood just coming down. I was like, what <laughs> yeah. happened, dude? Oh, yeah, I man. still got the pictures of the earpieces I was wearing. Were they and just the blood, drenched? The blood that's caked in there, yeah. Oh. Yeah, I saved the pictures. <laughs> so, yeah. I was a little oh, accident prone like that, though. The, 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 the things that shouldn't happen to people, for some reason, always happen to me. Yeah, well, we're, that's what we talked about. We were, we were mentioning that, like, there was – you were always kind of in harm's way, whether it was, you know – war or just life in general just, get, just. Yeah. mr accident uh, yeah yeah so um so then okay so you uh your battalion went to recce what what happened after that like you went to you were at acc for a while right you weren't you doing like some program manager stuff did you did you go to yeah. acc from the 17th or did you go somewhere else so from the 17th i went to um I went to Fort Bragg and went to the okay. 14th ASOS. So that, oh, okay. that that was nice because you're gone from an incredible ops tempo. And I was there for 11 years. And I don't think I've ever told anybody except Tommy Case this, uh, maybe a couple other guys. But after 11 years, the 17th, and the Rangers were my family, and the 17th was like my second home. Like yeah. you could blindfold me just like you. I could walk through and tell you everything. I knew where everything was. I could walk the halls and, um, and I knew that I would never in my life again, get to do that mission. I went into my, I have my U-Haul packed and I went in to get some stuff off of what was my old desk. And I'm not, I, I, I just remember this. I remember sitting at my desk and I cried. I mean, I was, I wept. I had tears coming out of my eyes and I cried like I've never cried in my life and for a solid 10 minutes. Yeah. I, I just, I was a slobbering mess. I had, and I, I was the only one in the, I was the only one in the building. I think yeah. it's because I thank God, Jay, because I think if you'd have done yeah. that with anybody else in there, you'd, <laughs> you'd never heard the end of it. I, I probably shouldn't be admitting to it now, but <laughs> yeah, we can cut it out but, if you want. Yeah. No, don't, no, don't cut it out. But, but I, I say, I tell like, that story. Yeah. I tell that story because I realized that I would never in my life get to be with such an amazing group of men. And I would never get to do that mission ever again in my life. And that I would, I knew that I would miss it so much. I really felt like that I was leaving my family. And in many ways I was, but I went to Fort, I went to Fort Bragg, went to the 14th ASOS and really got to finally be a flight chief with airmen that are, you know, right out of, right out of the TACP school. And it really ended up being just the highlight of my career, nice, getting nice. to be at Fort Bragg and be an NCIC and dealing with family issues with this guy, PME for this guy. And the guys are like li listening to you when you're explaining things and being a jump master for people that have anywhere from six or seven jumps to people with, you know, 20 or 30, and they're listening to you. They want to learn. They want to hear what you did in the Rangers. And they look up to you because they know you have that experience of being in a Ranger battalion. It was so rewarding to get to to get to do that. Uh, and then, of course, I did that for a time and then went over to group and was the group soup until Tommy Case left Avtag. And Tommy Case came over and was the group soup. Um, and then you had me and Tommy together again. Um we had a blast working on the group staff. It was really cool working for Mike Colthart. Um, yeah, 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 it was amazing. And then, so, well, real quick, that's a good point about uh, mentoring young guys because that's one thing you don't do at the seventeenth because you're just like everybody's yeah. old, and you know you may mentor a kid who just came in, but he's not a kid; yeah. he's like a staff sergeant or whatever. Um, but yeah, being able to to kind of pass your knowledge off that you acquired from the 17th on to 
young, young yeah. guys and kind of, you know, shape them in a way, you know, and there's a lot of good guys that did that. I mean, not just from us, but like, you know, the 22nd ace off stood up for a while. And then the, the, a lot of those yeah. guys went over there. And then there were also the 14s always been kind of a traditionally a hard charging unit. And they've always had really good dudes and, you know, guys kind yeah. of flowing yeah. out of the special operations community, whether they be at JCU or, um, you know, like I said, the 22nd or us. Um, sure. The, the, that unit's always been kind of squ really squared away in that regard because they've had good dudes coming in and out of there. But yeah, I could see how being able to, to impart that knowledge onto those kids would be rewarding, you know. And It, it is. Yeah. Because saying you're a great JTAC the 17th, means nothing. Everyone there is a great JTAC. It's All just right. what level of great are you? Like, I remember watching guys like you and Jazz Erickson go out and control aircraft and just, uh, you know, you'd be in awe. And, but, but I learned a lot, uh, you know, like you and I, that time we were at, we were out at Red Rio and you were giving me a check ride. Oh, yeah. I had live everything and I kept <laughs> messing up the AC-130 call sign. <laughs> yeah. And like the third time I did it, you grabbed me by my my shirt collar and slam me up against a connex and you're like dude if you freaking mess it up again um and i never messed the call sign up again but i i learned a valuable lesson like why it's important to maintain control of everything you have on your plate and not messing up something you might think is simple like a call sign it yeah. can get people killed later on so you know it's just constantly learning from guys like you and jazz and brandenburg uh tommy case uh, so saying you're a great JTAC the 17th really meant nothing because everybody yeah. there was a great JTAC. It's like you're supposed to be like, that's, yeah. we need, that's what we need you to be. So if you're not, then yeah. you gotta, you gotta go somewhere else. So, yeah. Yep. That's right. Yeah. That was, we were talking about check rides too. And we were telling them, um, we were kind of going over about how we try to make it as realistic as possible. That way, when you get in the fight, you know, you're not, it's not new to you. You know, you're like, Oh, I know exactly what's happening. I know I can, yep. I can control these five assets and I, you know, and that's in your defense, I think it was the gunship and uh, somebody else. Uh, they did have similar call signs. I mean, they were they were kind of similar. But like you said, if you keep calling the, you know, um, I don't even know what the other one was, probably UAV or something. Or maybe it was yeah. the if you if you're calling for fire with one asset and you're, you know, it's different then you know, you could you could it could be dangerous. So, yeah. But yeah, yeah, yeah that was a fun one. Yeah, that was fun. That was we were running all around. It was night. It was pretty good. That was a you doing that great. Was a fun, fun you're doing check awesome. Ride. You were doing a great job. I mean, uh, it was just that one thing. It was like it was just pissed yep. me off. It kind of rubbed me the wrong way. <laughs> <laughs> um. So then, uh, so you were at the group. You and Tom. What'd you guys do with the group? Like you were, um, did you guys just run training? I'm not training, but like, um, what well, kind of training? I mean, did you guys kind of have a so say I, what goes on? Out of necessity, I was the superintendent for a short period of time. Because what I what I what they moved me to group to do was run the parachute program for the 18th ASOG. Uh, I think I so, did know. I remember that now yep. that you say that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's free fall and that's static line. And um, so when Tom came over, Tom, uh, Tom took over as the group soup. I stayed on as the uh, doing that job, and then I ended up having handing that off to Kevin Caroon, and then. Uh, did my like last, it was probably only nine months at the ASOC. Oh, okay. Um, yep. How and was then, that? Uh, how was going, how was doing everything that you've done? How was it going to the ASOC? Like, was it, um, I mean, obviously I, I've never worked, I kind of, I guess I did kind of work in ASOC in Korea, but not really, but how was it? Was it, um, I mean, did you learn anything or was it like, eh? Yeah, no, I, I did. I learned a lot. I actually, I went to ASOC QC in Vegas. Nice. And, just a complete newfound respect for how an actual ASOC works. Yeah. And it was a great group of guys, man. And what was nice is those TACPs don't want to be there, right? They want to go out to the regular line units at some point. So sure. I spent my time there taking them out, doing training, making sure they were the best at their job, main, made sure that they maintained their JTAC proficiency because they would eventually leave the ASOC and, and right. a lot of them did. And I worked hard to get guys that had been there way too long. Because certain leadership uh, previous to Mike Colthart uh, just put guys in ASOC and just kept them there because they were yeah. good at their job. So I worked hard to get them out of there and get them back into the 14th. And by the time I left, we had got most of the guys out and back into a line unit. And they were happy and loving life again. So Good deal. Um, 
But yeah, when you get to that level, that many years in the military and that level of leadership, your job is really, you've had your fun. That's that's yeah. what I say, right? I've that's done my sure. missions. I've had my fun. It ain't about me anymore. It right. is about taking care of these guys. The next group of guys are going to go be out on the X with the Rangers. Yep. Like, that's their goal was to get there. Right. Um, so I want to take care of them. And I wanted to make sure that they had that opportunity. So yeah, that's, that's what's good. rewarding about leadership. Yeah. Some people think like uh, just because you go to an ASOC that that's it, you know, you're done, but that, yeah, that's you. And I, we kind of talked about it last time, but the um, you're only, it's on you to be as good as you want to be. You know, if you, who cares, it doesn't matter where you are, you can still train, you can still work out, you can still shoot, you know, you still hone your skills and be just as good as you're going to be. Um, because you will eventually leave and have to do something else. So, you know. Yeah. But yeah. You can't do it forever, man. Right. You can't right. do it forever. I know we talked to, we were talking about when Schleich went down range with first bat when he first got to the 17th. Um, but that was only, he didn't take a slot away from a guy. It was just, we, there happened to be an open slot. Some, we, they needed a JTAC. So he went. Um, but it was good because he got to, um, you know, see how the Rangers, because he'd never been exposed to the, the Rangers of the 17th or anything. So it was good for him yeah. to go and get that exposure, but he didn't take it. He, like we were kind of saying, he didn't, he was a higher ranking dude. He didn't take a slot away from a guy. It just happened to work out. So it was good. Sure. Um, so you were, you went from the ASOC, but then, then where'd you go after that? So I, I work with Mike Colthart cause Mike knew, uh, was good friends with Mike Bender, chief okay. Bender yep. retired. Yep. And he said, Hey Mark, they need a JTAC program manager at the Pentagon. And I'm like, well, what, what does that mean? Yeah. It's like, that, that means you run the entire JTAC program. You'll be doing a lot. It's a all desk work, but you're going to be writing AFIs and, uh, you know, looking over policy and looking over how the program works. And I said, dude, that sounds really good to me. I, I very much would like to live in DC. Um, <laughs> were you kidding or were you? You were joking, right? I mean, I was being dead serious. It actually ended up being a great experience because that's okay, where good. I met my my current wife, and, and oh, right it just on. worked out really good. But I very much enjoyed. Uh, so yeah, because Mike Colthart made the recommendation, I met the requirements. Mike Bender had no problem uh, taking Mike Colthart at his word, and I got the assignment and, and got to go take over for uh, Chief uh, Blakely. Oh yeah, um, yep, who was up there at the time? He was a senior master sergeant at the time. Had just made it. And was PCS in the Fort Hood uh, and made chief not too long after that. But man, I enjoyed my three years there. Typically at the Pentagon, it's one and a half years at the most. Yeah. Two, you're stretching it. It's almost unheard of people being at the Pentagon for three years like I oh, was because really? it, it just absolutely smashes you. It's awful. Yeah. The morass of how things work and just the processes and the layers of BS you have to deal with to get anything approved. Well, that's the, uh, that's unreal. the focal point. That's the, the epicenter of bureaucracy the, you know, so I can imagine getting anything done would just be like pulling teeth. It's, it's, it's awful, but here's, what's nice. You have to be professional. You have to, you have to learn a lot of, I would say higher level admin type stuff and how processes work, yeah. budgets and things of that nature and how, how the military really operates yeah. and just how small your slice of the pie really is. Um, so that was really good for me as a final assignment because I got to actually shape a lot of different things like the uh, formal training unit. Um, not that I had a major hand in it, but I got to, I got to shape that a little bit. Right. I got to just think of right somebody AFIs. else who might not have had, Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to cut you off, but I was just thinking like, yeah. just think of it had been somebody else who hadn't had that kind of Ranger sesh soft stink on you. You know, yeah. it could have gone a different way, maybe. So I'm sure you had some great inputs that, you know, shaped yeah. that a little bit. I, I think so. And I, I work with great guys up there. You know, Chief Nugent, uh, Chief Corbett. Oh, you know, yeah, Chief Bender of course. And a few months yeah. he had left. And then I that's where I first met. Uh, I first met Steve Burrow. Okay. Uh, so yeah. Steve, Steve Burrow retired as a chief. Yep. And he yep. was actually the career field manager. Now, now, here's a funny story. Steve Burrow retired as a chief. But before he retired, he is the guy that got my retraining packet and uh, approved it. Really? He approved my retraining packet when he was a chief. No yes. kidding. Jeez. That's how things work back then. Wow. And so when I got to the Pentagon, he's a civilian and yep. he's working for our shop. And Steve and I became 
best friends. He retired in 2018. And to this day, this is not a joke. I text him every single day of my life. Me and him really? talk for hours on end, texting back and forth. I don't know Steve that well, but I, from the interactions I've had with him, he just top notch guy. Just, you know, just uh, he's a amazing. Dude. Yeah, just a yeah, great I, guy. Um, and then you got, so then you retired and you said 2019, right? Uh, 2019. Yep. Retired. Yep. And actually I was set to take a job doing what most JTACs do, which is go overseas somewhere or go with some small company and go do the JTAC thing as a civilian. And I would have been going overseas. It was big money and I was pretty much guaranteed the job. Yeah. And at the, at the zero hour, I decided to reach out to someone on my network that was locally here in Ohio and associated with Wright Patterson Air Force Base. And she was pretty high up. She got my resume and said, Hey, I know a company that I think is looking for a guy with your particular background. So she put me in touch with this company. Uh, their HR department called me and said, Hey, we want to interview you. Uh, we're going to buy you a plane ticket. We're going to fly you to Dayton. Can you come tomorrow? I said, No, but give me two days. I came here, interviewed, and it was awesome. Within two days, I had an offer, and life just fell into place. Nice. Um, I'm back home in Ohio where all my yeah, friends. Yeah, yeah. I was going to say, that's where you're from. My friend is. Yep. Yeah. Um, the funny story about my interview, and, and for anybody listening that's getting ready to transition, uh, <laughs> the resume, I, I'm telling you, I paid for someone to do my resume like $1,000, oh. and I did multiple iterations and in in the end i ended up just doing my own freaking resume because nobody knows your background better than you right and it's just trial and error so i think i had a pretty good resume and i went in and did a panel interview so i i had several people interview me over the course of three hours and one guy who ended up being my a a really good friend uh, where i currently work he's sitting there and he's interviewing me goes mark i read your resume before you came in he goes, I'll tell you, impressive. Um, he goes, you know, I think you're the type of guy we're looking for. Uh, but he goes, I have a question for you. He goes, it says on here, you're a military free fall jump master. He goes, we don't jump out of airplanes here, uh, this organization. <laughs> and he had a real straight face. And I'm like, oh, God, I, how do I? I didn't cover this in interview prep. And then he started <laughs> laughing. And it was at that moment I realized. From this point forward, if I get this job, I will mentor other people and tell them, forget about the military fluff. You really don't need it because yeah. nobody cares if you jumped out of airplanes. That's a great point. That's a great yeah. point. Yeah. Unless you're yeah, doing so, like, yeah, unless it's some high speed, you know, like unit or job that you're doing that stuff. But yeah, if yeah. it's some corporate job, yeah. they're like, you know, <laughs> no one cares. If if they even yeah. know what that even means. Like, you know, like when I tell people yeah, like no, I, I, exactly. When I tell people I was a you know, we all work with fire support. They think I'm a firefighter. You know, I'm like, no, it's a little different than that. You know, not the same thing. Well, um, it's funny. I, I had a guy, another guy that was interviewing me said, uh, he was kind of looking through my resume and he's like, Hey, I was looking through your medals. He's like, you got six bronze stars. He goes, and that seems like a lot of, a lot of one medal. He goes, is that similar to like an achievement medal? He's like, I work with one of the airmen I work with in the lab has a couple of <laughs> achievement medals. And I said, I, I said, yeah, it's similar. You get it for uh, service a little or higher, whatever. Yeah. yeah. But the guy legitimately, he didn't know. So right. I, you know, I tell that to guys that will seek out my advice or transitioning to say, not everybody in the civilian world is number one, either impressed with your, with your military background or some of your accolades and medals, but, but also most of them just don't know what it means. Mm-hmm. So, you know, oh, cool. Tommy, Tommy Case has got two silver stars. Like, we think that's the coolest thing in the world. He's only like the third guy in the Air Force to ever receive two of them. Right. But if Tom ever goes into some big industry business that doesn't really deal with the military, they're like, okay, cool. Two silver stars. Why don't you have three? I mean, you know, they don't, yeah. they don't really you know, know what that means. So right. I tell guys not to hang their hat on their awards and their schools because it's probably not going to apply. It'll get you some cool points maybe, but that's about it. Yeah. Like, unfortunately it would be better to have like a, a master's degree in the field in which they're hiring you for. Yeah. Or, or, that's um, correct. 
or like a leadership course or, you know, like, uh, or whatever, you know, like a professional manager certificate or, yeah. you know, those things were, or maybe, um, you know, you took a class on the, the job that, or whatever you're going to, yeah. That, Cause they, you're right. They, they have no idea about what any of that means. So yeah, yeah that's yeah. a good point. That's a great point. <laughs> yeah, no, no idea. Oh, cool. You jump out of airplanes. I, 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 I went on, uh, I went on a tandem <laughs> jump once. Like, you know, they don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I saw Point Break. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> I could give maybe one more s- small story. I-, I don't know. I've never told anybody. It's kind of an. It's kind of interesting. It's very very short. Yeah. Uh, uh, it's another situation where a ground force commander is like pressing me to do something that I perceive to be very dangerous, and I actually got in trouble for it. But then I got commended for it. Um, oh, right on. But no, I think it, I think it, I'd never told anybody. I just think it'd be it'd be worth telling. I mean, it's is it cool. something that um, someone would get butthurt about? Or I mean, I don't want to. No, because I'm not. I'm not. Gonna, I'm not going to mention the name. Besides, the guy was a he was a clown ranger. Oh, okay. Company commander. They brought down from staff as a major, and the dude didn't have a clue what he was doing. He's just screwing up by the numbers, like okay, twenty four seven. Yeah, go go for it. I'd love to hear it. Yeah, yeah. So. On one particular deployment, kind of, you know, similar to the story where I, with the B-1, I decided not to drop on a building. Yeah. Because my gut just told me, I can't do it. I don't know where the friendlies are. I was out on a mission with the Rangers at night, and we had hit the X. We had made contact. We had squirters everywhere. And it was a high-value target. So we want to kill or capture everybody coming off of that building. Sure. And so I had ISR. Uh, and Apaches tracking two squirters coming off the X. And I told the, I told the ground force commander, Hey, sir, two squirters are heading North. They're like a, they're like 500 meters from us. I mean, we're not going to catch them on, on foot. Right. And he said, okay. He's like, that's what I want you to do. JTAC. I want you to tell that Apache pilot to go a few hundred meters in front of them. And I want them to land their aircraft on the ground and <laughs> redirect them. I said, well, sir, we're in an industrial area. And I'm pointing to all these power lines. This is in Iraq. Right. And I said, yeah, "Yeah." I'm like, sir, here's the problem. If I tell them, if I tell them to do it, they will do it. And uh, because they will do whatever it takes to support the ground force. You know, the the, the pilots in the sky are just as brave as the ground force, especially the helo guys. Um, So I said, I, I, I can't tell them. He goes, well, he goes, I am telling you to do it. You're the JTAC. You have to do what I tell you. He's like, if you won't do it, I'm going to have the RTO jump up on the freak and he's going to do it. I said, sir, we are, we are not doing that. He goes, give me the freak. Give me the frequency that aircraft is on. I said, sir, I'm not doing it. And I had a H250 dynamic. That's what I used for the rotary wing. Cause I had ISR in this air. I had fixed wing in this air and I would take the H250 and shove it up under my Peltors. Sure. So this guy grabbed the mic out of my hand to, to tell the birds to that. Hey, I am the commander. You're going to, you're going to do this. So I don't know what came over me, but I ripped the mic out of his hand and I punched him in his chin and said, (laughs) Oh my God. I just remember he looks at me in complete (laughs) shock. And I said, sir, it, I said, I'm sorry, but I was like, if you will listen to me for a second, I, we can do redirecting fires, but I'm not going to tell the aircraft to land on top yeah. of two human beings running through a field where there's wires. Right. So, uh, so like, that's was, the whole point. It's like, what that's it, his job is not to tell you how to do your job. It's to say, look, this is the end state. Yeah. How, how should we do it? You know, how, yeah, you're look, the expert. Yeah. What should we do? You know, or whatever. Yeah, let me figure out the tactics to get you to the solution you want to get to. Right. Um, so I was expecting we ended up getting the squirters. I had the Apaches do 30 millimeter dry uh live runs. It actually redirected them back a few hundred meters, and they were so scared that they just sit. So we were able to actually go up, not me, but the QRF and interdict them and get these guys and, and take them off the take them off the objective dude what if those guys would have had weapons in the in the apaches landed and yeah you know they just like they shot at them or whatever i mean they could have that could have been a lot worse they absolutely it could have been could have been any worse. i mean so, that's just one scenario but it could have gone any it could have gone bad anyway yeah 
Good on you, so man. So I got a very stern talking to. I can imagine. <laughs> I, I, I mean, when we say stern, like I was basically told, you know, hey, your career could have ended by what you did. However, they recognized that what he was asking me to do, and then he started getting physical with me. They they believe you're correct, you know, Sergeant Foster, that if these aircraft would have landed, they would have been in jeopardy of getting hit with an RPG or getting shot. Like Anything, yeah. Or or clip a tree or clip a wire. So right. um so anyway, yeah, I mean being a JTAC is not always dropping bombs, right? It's knowing when to say, This is dumb, we shouldn't be doing this, I can't right. do this, this is this is not legal, or this is unsafe. So JTAC's got a lot of pressure on him, right? And in the seventeenth, sure. you got the weight of the world on your shoulders because you're by yourself, right? There is nobody that has your back. You make that final clearance call, it's on you. You yep. can't turn to another JTAC and say, hey, does this look good to you? Right. Um, so, hey, who chewed you out? Was it Army or Air Force? It was both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I got chewed out by both. But, uh, yeah, that, that happened. Um, you anyway, know, the thing about there's, it is there's no guarantee that even if you – even if that ground force commander would have directed those helos – I mean, at, at the end of the day, they're the aircraft commander. They, they're not going to put their aircraft in jeopardy anyway, so – even if you did get on there, they they might not have done it anyway. But I'm glad that yeah. I'm glad to hear that you you had the fourth foresight to see that that's not a good idea. Like putting because yeah. that's they're vulnerable. They're sitting on the ground. Yeah, that's a that's the worst place for a helo. I mean, really, you know, yep. and they want to be very, up looking and you know, kind of where they can engage. Very vulnerable <laughs> situation. Yeah, and you know, I guess my whole career, just like yours, JD, we could spend probably days if not weeks just telling little stories like that right yeah the, the little things right everybody wants to hear about the firefights and and this and that and the other but honestly my my best memories are of sitting out and like in afghanistan and talking with captain russ ripito yeah. about like life and about his dad in vietnam and then right just forming a friendship with him and then having no idea that a year later I would hear the call come over the net that he he was the first casualty of the Iraq uh, War of 2000. Yeah. He and you know uh, certain first class long and certain uh, Nino Leveda you know got blown up by a pregnant woman with the suicide vest. Um, but it's the little things like that, right? That you just yeah that you, yeah Leveda was about. in that was was Leveda still in ACO at that time? I know he I knew him from ACO before, but I don't know if he had switched companies or something or. Uh, I, I think, yeah, I think that he was, so he would, he had taken like, I don't want to say support staff because there's no such thing as a ranger in support, but he right. was in a, he was in a leadership position doing something uh, on the, I don't know in, in what shop, the S2, yeah. S3, something okay. like that. But um, Yeah, I know what you mean, man. Like when people talk about um, like, you know, we do it for the guy to the left or the right of us. It's kind of like people it gets glossed over, but it's it's not like it's not like it is a patriotic thing, but it's not some cosmic crazy thing. It's like no, because I spend so much time with these guys. We're sitting in tents, we're sitting out on OPs, we're sitting, you know, just uh waiting to go on missions. We're we're in missions together. You know, you spend so much time with these guys and you spend you know these you know just normal experiences with them, like life experiences. And, uh, and I mean, that's, that's where it stems from, you know, it's not yeah. some, you know, they, people try to over dramatize it, but it's really just, it's like, yeah, of course I'm going to check these guys. Look, we spend some where, you know, yeah. we're, they're my friends they're they're my buddies, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I know. And then you hear about your guys that didn't make it. It's tragic. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Well, Mark, you man, wonder... I can't thank you enough for getting on here, dude. Yeah, man. Um, I... uh, and, uh, like I said, we're going to be on, when is that? A couple of weeks now we'll have you and. Kevin and Maddie on here. So yeah, you, you cut out there for a second. Oh, I was just saying, uh, uh, it was good having you on. Um, and like, uh, we'll see you in a couple of weeks. I'll have you and Maddie and Kevin on and we'll tell some more yeah. stories. Hopefully. Yeah. Super excited. I can't wait to get together with the crew. Of course we'll draw you into it. And then, you know, I, any, anyone that will ask me, I always tell them my time at the 17th, I have many mentors, but you were definitely one of those guys I, I refer to you as a man's man. Like, you know, you took care of your business. You took care of your guys. You were always at the leading edge of like what right looks like. 
Um, so man, I, I was just lucky to have guys like you and Brandy and Matt Schleich and Tom Case that like showed me what being a JTAC was, but more importantly than that, being a man and being a good, uh, just a good all around airman. Right. Yeah. The, uh, well, I appreciate the it. Man. The business, so. That's good to hear. You know, I appreciate it. We try to do our best and we hopefully it, it comes through that way. So. Yep. Yeah. All right, man. Well, it's nice good talking to you, man. Can't wait to talk to you in a couple of weeks. Yeah. I'll see you then. All right, buddy. We'll see you. Bye.